A deadly new surge in stronger and cheaper methamphetamine creates major challenges for San Diego law enforcement and healthcare professionals. A ruling from the state Supreme Court this week could make it difficult for the Chargers to make their dream of a new stadium in San Diego a reality. And a half-cent transit tax is going on the ballot in November after Sandag reached a compromise with some environmental groups. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today are Kenny Goldberg, medical reporter for KPBS News. Hi, Kenny. Hi, Mark. Good to have you back today. David Garrick, government and education reporter for the San Diego Union Tribune. Hi, Dave. Hi, Mark. Good to see you back again today. And KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Mark. Well, in spite of increased use of heroin and opioids, uh, methamphetamine, an insidious, highly addictive drug never really went away in San Diego. In fact, it's causing more deaths, more crime, and more misery than ever. Now, Kenny, you had a three-part series on this uh, this week. Give us the high points, outline the reasons, what's behind this latest spike here in San Diego. Well, as you said, it's a drug that's never really gone out of popularity, and the drugs that are coming in now the methamphetamine is stronger than ever and it's cheaper than ever on the street. Mm -hmm. It used to be made in makeshift labs in East County and people's backyards. Now it's primarily made in Mexican super labs mm -hmm. in a very scientific way. It's like breaking bad. So in other words, the meth is very powerful and it's dirt cheap, so it's really driving this, uh, this epidemic. So widely distributed, available, and anybody who doesn't have to look too far to get it. That's yeah. right. All right, now describe the impact of meth use on the healthcare system here. Well, in just the past few years, the number of emergency room visits related to meth have absolutely skyrocketed. I think they've quadrupled in about four or five years. We have more deaths from methamphetamine than we've ever seen before. It was 262 in 2014. The 2015 figures are coming out pretty soon. I understand they're going to be even higher. So uh, it's really devastating on the healthcare system. Yeah, and the emergency room visits are way up as well, right? That's right. Yeah. And uh, it's a very pernicious drug. It can cause uh, psychosis, uh, rotted teeth. It exacerbates any kind of underlying health problems you have in terms of heart conditions. Psychological problems you may have. Yes, yeah. right. And uh, it's just an absolutely devastating drug health-wise. All right, we've got a bite here. You interviewed uh, Jonathan Lucas, San Diego County Deputy Medical Examiner. Here's what he had to say about the surge on these uh, meth-related deaths and who's dying. The last couple years have actually been records for us. We haven't we, we've seen more methamphetamine-related deaths in the last couple of years than we've ever seen uh, in the last 20 years. For example, in 2014, our youngest uh, meth-related death was a 17-year-old girl that jumped out of a second-story window uh, while intoxicated with methamphetamine. Our oldest was a 70-year-old man. All right, and these overdose uh, stats on meth, they don't really tell even the whole story, right? No, they don't. Uh, the overdose, uh, they're just, they're deaths. But as the uh, numbers in the emergency rooms show, there's a whole lot more people, thousands of people a year, that have meth-related health problems they go to the emergency room for. And not everybody who's sick goes to the hospital either. So it's, it's a much bigger problem than the, than the death and overdose. As death big as that death number is, which is rather shocking. Right. Now, uh, who are the meth users? Do we really know we, the, the doctor that talked about the, the range and age and all that, that they've seen, but is there really a demographic breakdown? Well, as the uh, medical, deputy medical examiner was saying, there's definitely, uh, it's all, it affects all age groups. Nobody's uh, exempt from it. In terms of uh, income levels, I think it's more low-income people that are involved in it than, than the elite, per se. But the other thing to keep in mind is it has a really uh, devastating effect on crime. They've had uh, a high percentage of people in San Diego jails test positive for meth now. I think it's 40% of male arrestees and 53% of, of women arrested. Or arrested into the county jail system here. Test positive. So these, these folks come in, they get arrested for whatever uh, uh, crime that they're uh, accused of, and they automatically test them, and this is what's, what's coming up here. Right. So, so I mean, that's, uh, as you say, 53%, obviously, a majority there. If it's David? cheap, I wouldn't think that they're being arrested for crimes trying to get money to buy it. So maybe just something about being on it makes you 
more more reckless? Because if it's cheap, I wouldn't think you'd have to rob a store to get money to buy it. But well, it's cheap, but it's uh, you need a lot of money if you're hooked on it. Got it. Because yeah. you're using it many times a day. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, the 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 uh, guy in recovery I interviewed for this story was shooting up six times a day at his peak. Yeah. That's a lot of methamphetamine. Yeah. It's a lot of money. So even if it's relatively cheap to cocaine or some other uh, drugs used recreationally or people are addicted to, you're still using it so often. That right, and a, they're, they're robbing, they're committing robberies, they're committing violent crimes to fuel their habit. It's probably hard to keep a quality job, too, if you're on right. meth all day. Yeah, forget There's no such thing as a functioning meth user, yeah. or well, is there, it, maybe? I, a, I suppose there is to a certain extent, yeah. yeah, but it's, as I said, it really affects your mind. It actually alters the brain with long-term meth use. Heavy meth use actually changes the structure of the brain. Mm -hmm. And again, it's so addictive because uh, it just in initially stimulates those pleasure centers in the, in the brain. That's exactly right. Uh, the drug stimulates the dopamine levels in the brain in a, to a higher extent than any other human activity. Better than sex, better than anything else that uh, you get pleasure from. Methamphetamine just sends the dopamine levels to the moon, and that's why it, it's so addictive. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say uh, you mentioned that the fellow you interviewed, uh, Jose uh, Escobedo of National City, uh, says he began using meth when he was only 11 years old. Let's, let's hear uh, what he had to say. I was offered a smoke. I mean, and I didn't know nothing of it, and I'm just trying to fit in with these guys. And I take a first hit, uh, first hit of smoke off some aluminum, and once I did that, it was, like, it was like a whole totally took me to another like world. It boosted me up, and I felt all this rush. I felt this, like I could do stuff, right? I mean, like, I, uh, um, like if I was stronger, faster, and everything. And then I, we walked out, and then I started hallucinating, seeing things. All right, he was uh, obviously using it for a long, long time. What did, what did he do to, to get clean, and what did people try to do to get off this drug? Well, he spent four different stints in prison and he was arrested while well, he was on parole a few years ago. And the prosecutor said, look, you're either going back to jail for 12 years or you can try to clean up your act through something called drug court. He says, I'll take it, I'll go for it. And drug court is a, a treatment program throughout the United States. There are four different drug courts in San Diego County where it's a very intense, rigorous 18 month program of recovery with close supervision, 12 step meetings, uh, the uh, applicants have to get a job, so on and so forth, and it's it's very rigorous, and they uh, it really helps a lot of people clean up their act, and ho that's how Jose got clean. Now, is that a difference from the time? And of course, in the '80s, we were known as the meth capital back then, and you explained earlier on how it's gone from these kind of makeshift and small operations to a, a more sophisticated operation and and, and uh, imported from Mexico, etc. But uh, have we shifted all already to in terms of the people who are arrested, who are in prison, are they getting more help, more rehab, more counseling, uh, more uh, incentive to get clean than than before? Uh, the programs improved in uh, in jails. I can't really speak to whether the programs have improved in jails, but there are plenty of treatment programs outside of jail, and, and this one that I was speaking of, drug court, really is a viable option for nonviolent drug offenders who want to clean up their act. They don't only have to be on methamphetamine. What, what about the idea yeah. that, and that sounds great and important, but I imagine it's also important to try to get people to stop trying it in the first place. I mean, is, how, how, I mean education for young people, is there any hope there? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, somebody asked me the other day, are we making any progress on the fight against meth? Because the law enforcement has been at it for a long, long time. And I'd have to say uh, seizures are way up at the border. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, this drug continues to wreak havoc here, and there's really, I don't see how they can stop it. They, they're not stopping it. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a great series on uh, uh, this week on KPBS, and uh, of course, uh, folks can catch up on it uh, on our website and listen to it and read uh, read about it more there in a lot more detail. Thanks, Kenny. We're going to move on. Thrown for a loss, a big play, flag. Plenty of football metaphors come to mind with what the Chargers are facing in trying to get public financial support for a new downtown stadium. The news this week involved a decision by the California Supreme Court that has a bearing on the NFL team's ballot initiative and their hopes this fall. Dave David, start there. What was the week's news here regarding the court? Uh, the week's news, which was, had been somewhat anticipated or, or thought about, was that the state Supreme Court has decided to review a lower court ruling that created a lot of hope for the Chargers. 
Um, it, it said that it's possible that their initiative, which would raise hotel taxes, would only need to be approved this November by 50% plus one of voters uh, instead of two thirds. Mm -hmm. Two thirds has been the law in California mm -hmm. for a long time. This would have been a significant, you know, positive development for folks trying to pass tax increases. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, ch the chargers would have been eligible for it because it was a citizen's initiative instead of government. There was there was some optimism. The chargers themselves have always said we thought it was going to be two thirds, but chargers fans and fan groups and supporters have all thought it was important to have this 50% and might help it get passed. And because the Supreme Court has chosen to review it, it reverts back now to the two-thirds requirement. Okay, and so they haven't actually, as you say, overturned this lower court ruling, which came in, came in March. They're right. just kind of taking it onto their agenda now. Right, so. but but the way that the, the court system works is once they take it onto their agenda, in other words, the lower court ruling was the law of the land from March until Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it's no longer the law of the land mm -hmm. because the Supreme Court has chosen to review it, which automatically does something called depublishing it, mm -hmm. right? Which means now it goes back to what the law was before, which is two-thirds requirement. And the chances of the Supreme Court making a decision before November are, from all the legal experts I talked to, almost zero. Okay. They, well, they give take it, their time. Give us the high points of uh, that proposal again. Remind us what uh, what uh, voters would be looking at. Voters would be looking at, well, the, char the chargers want to raise the hotel yeah. tax in San Diego from 12.5% to 16.5%, and that would raise $650 million for a stadium, and the rest of the money would come from the L uh, from the NFL, uh, and then personal seat licenses, similar to, to the previous approvals that they, uh, previous proposals they'd had before, but this one combines a convention center, mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's called a convadium. Right, the convadium. So it's downtown in these several blocks that are east of Park right, exactly. and it's part convention center, part football stadium here, and mixed use, obviously. And, uh, and what's our total cost of this whole? One point eight billion dollars. One point eight billion dollars. The NFL's kicking in some. The Chargers are kicking in some, and, and the taxpayers. Or the, and, but the, they would argue that it's not local taxpayers. It's folks who are staying in hotels here. Mm -hmm. So you could argue it's tourists who's, who's kicking it in, but it is yeah. tax money. And, and again, that money, if, if there's a revenue stream there, would be available for any number of other needs and That's uses. True. We raised the hotel tax and didn't build a convadium. We'd have more money for firefighters, right. more money for parks, yeah. well, libraries. Uh, fixing yeah. streets, water, et cetera. Kenny, you're, you're going to say something here. Well, the two-thirds threshold, uh, I mean, I have to imagine that's incredibly difficult to get. People joke and say you couldn't get two-thirds of people to agree that the sky the is blue. blue. Right? Yeah, we I mean, want clean air cliche, water, but I mean, yeah. I think it, it is. And this is one that this is a, a proposal that already has a lot of opposition. Some will argue it's because the hotel industry, you know, doesn't want to see their, their tax rate go up. Uh, but there's also folks who feel like, you know, this, the line is billionaires should pay for their own stadiums. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they lose sight of the fact that the NFL sort of has a monopoly and they do have leverage, you know, that's why those billionaires ne don't necessarily have to pay for their own stadiums typically. But I understand there, there's a lot of angst people saying, why should a billionaire get a subsidized stadium? So I mean, it was gonna be hard for it to get 50% according to some polls I've seen. And I, I've not heard of any poll that comes close to two thirds. Now the Chargers may be doing some internal polling we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Or this could just be another show mm -hmm. that they're they're trying to demonstrate. You know, we're, we did our best. We tried to get San Diego to work with us, but we're just going to move to L.A. And I certainly so. heard that theory, and, and it's certainly possible. But yeah. I, you could argue they could have just said in in January we're going to go to Inglewood. Right. Right. It, it didn't work. We tried for years. It didn't work. Why spend millions to run? Why this spend all these millions thing, in yeah. order? I mean, and the theory would be okay. We want people in San Juan Capistrano and Riverside County to think we really tried, and so they don't hate us. I just don't know if that's worth the time and effort they're spending now. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you calculate that. I'm sure they did. Mm -hmm. Well, why would the Chargers want to take a risk on putting on the ballot this fault? They have to hit that two-thirds majority. In other words, why not just wait to see what the Supreme Court says? There's a chance they could uh, kick it back. <laughs> I, I, suppose, I, 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 I mean, Sometimes it's two or three years. I'm not, oh, saying, it, I'm right? not saying it would be. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, that's more controversial ones. An example is in San Jose, there was a rule about whether text messages are public uh, records. And they said in July 2014, we're going to do this, and they still haven't had, had oral arguments. Mm. right? But that, uh, that's not always like that, so it could be a little faster. I suppose they could ask the NFL for, for an extension, but the, w the decision the NFL made last January said, the Rams get to go to L.A., and the Chargers have one year to decide whether to join them. So that's why it's now. And then there's the Oakland Andrew. Raiders also, because if the Chargers decide they want to stay in San Diego, then the Oakland Raiders then have this option to join the Rams. Ah, yes, so, I know. Although you know. they've been talking this week, there have been the rumors right. in the sports press about them moving to Las Vegas. So it's so very possible. The Raiders that, announced they were going to Vegas. But that's true. The, the, deal, is, the yeah. deal as it stands, you have these two teams kind of uh, jockeying. And, right. But and what would line. prevent okay. the Chargers from saying, okay, well, this is going to happen now. So let's just keep uh, keep the stadium deal as long as we can. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they would prefer to join Strang Kroenke and Inglewood than stay in, in an aging Qualcomm stadium. I mean, I think they've looked at the revenue they would get from joining Kroenke, and I never saw the deal because they didn't make it public, but I, I'm sh 
I'm almost certain it's much more lucrative than what they're getting here. That's we why they've been complaining. We should point out Cronky is the owner of the Rams bringing Sorry. the St. Louis team back to But they have to pay a half a billion dollar relocation fee, right? And, and I, you know, Kenny, I'm not in there and, and when they're looking at all the numbers, <laughs> but, I, but I know that they've been whining about, their, they've been complaining about this stadium for quite a long time because it doesn't generate the kind of revenue a modern stadium was with luxury boxes and all of those types of things. And Mayor Faulkner, of course, had the blue ribbon panel. They came up with a big rebuild out there at Qualcomm. Obviously, Chargers just aren't interested in that at all because they pushed their whole proposal downtown. It appears their calculus is that we prefer uh, downtown San Diego, number one, Englewood, number two, and Mission Valley, third or, or a distant yeah. distant fifth. I don't know I don't know where it is on the list. And where is that proposal? It's kind of nowhere. This one is, is headed for the ballot, this one in downtown yeah. the Chargers are pushing, but that Qualcomm rebuild, Mission Valley, Faulkner's plan, that's kind of nowhere. And August 2nd is the deadline to put it on the ballot. Not that anyone's even considering that, but I'm saying once you get past that, it can't get on the ballot. Right. And that's a key element is that that was, that was public funding, but only required 50% approval because it wasn't a tax increase. Mm -hmm. It was gonna use general fund money. But some folks have said, oh, well, can't they just revert to the Mission Valley proposal if, if this vote fails mm -hmm. in December? The problem is that the Mission Valley proposal needs to be a public vote because otherwise it's vulnerable to a referendum. And as you've seen in San Diego, those mm -hmm. happen all the time. Right. So they couldn't just all of a sudden call city up and we're going to go back to Mission Valley because then opponents could come and do a referendum. And, and right. Faulkner Andrew. said, we're going to have a vote on this. Yes. I promise that. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so what happens in the fall? Let's say it gets on the ballot and it goes down to defeat. Then what happens? Then the Chargers have till January 15th, I believe, to decide whether to move to L.A. or then I guess the, then the Raiders would take over the Chargers spot, would have the right to take over the Chargers spot, and the Chargers would be stuck here with no L.A. rights. Provided they hadn't made some sort of deal in Las Vegas or somewhere else, mm -hmm. maybe back in Oakland. But I think no. they would need NFL approval for that. So just on what's actually been already agreed to, right. on January 15th, the Chargers don't choose to go to Englewood. The Raiders then get the first position to go to Englewood. So it's this, it's this initiative or bust, basically. For them to stay in San Diego. Uh, uh, I guess so. I mean, it, I guess if that happened and the Raiders took over, then the Chargers theoretically could revive Mission Valley. If they just have no interest in, in going to Inglewood, then they would be forced, I guess, to revive San Diego in some other way than yeah. that would pass. All right. Uh, we'll move on. But uh, the other quick question, or the, I'll just throw it out there for you and everybody else, is uh, are we tired of this whole story? Is there Charger fatigue? Me. There we go. <laughs> There's a poll of one right there. All right, we'll move on. Another never-ending struggle is transportation. Do we try to get people on the mass transit or even bicycles? Do we widen freeways to reduce congestion, encouraging more vehicles? That was Sandag's dilemma as it worked to uh, come up with a transit plan for the November ballot. A compromise was reached, so a new half-cent sales tax increase is going to be on that ballot. Generate billions over many decades for transportation. The lion's share, uh, according to this proposal, going to public transit. So, Andrew, start with the specifics of this. So, wh what will it mean? What will voters be uh, seeing on that ballot? It's a half-cent sales tax levied across San Diego County. Uh, it would last 40 years, uh, and so that's expected to generate, as you said, about $18 billion over that time. Um, most of the money does go to public transit, about 42 percent. Uh, the next biggest share goes to local infrastructure, defined fairly broadly. Uh, there's, um, uh, the, and the transit, by the way, would be improved operations, so more frequent bus lines and trolley operations, and also new bus lines and a new trolley line. Um, there's some more money for highway expansions, about 14%, uh, and a little bit for open space preservation and biking, walking projects, things like that. All right, so some public transit advocates and environmentalists, basically, were not happy with an earlier version, and there's some, I, I guess, still some disagreement well, there among most of them are still unhappy with yeah. it. So there's this co coalition of, of environmental labor progressive groups called the Quality of Life Coalition. They came together when the, the discussion about this tax was really uh, getting into gear, and they said, this is our vision for what uh, for a tax that we could actually support. Uh, it included, um, you know, s substantial funding for public transit. Uh, because labor was involved, it included a project labor agreement, which would then guarantee union wages and benefits are paid uh, on the, all the construction, the construction projects. Construction, yeah. And uh, and it would not include freeway expand, and this is important. Freeway expansions in certain communities that that are low income and. Uh, heavy minority populations because they're the ones that don't drive on the freeways as often and the all the cars driving through there pollute the air they're they get you know, the brunt of it all but they're not exactly, really using it. exactly so um, you know 
overall, looking at the plan, I think a lot of environmentalists just saw it as an extension. Or, I mean, all the projects that this, this tax would fund are already included in the Sandag Regional Transportation Plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and most, uh, if not all, environmental organizations objected to that. So this was just basically, uh, you know, DOA for them. I think they did have uh, some hope that they could maybe craft this tax into something that they could support, but um, it didn't turn out that All way. All right, we do have a, a bite, a clip from uh, Colin Parent of Circulate San Diego, the, the bike folks. Let's hear that. This is going to give real clear assurances both to advocates for transit, but then also to the voting public that Sandag is going to make uh, uh, transit a priority and is going to build it in early periods of their plan. All right. I think that brings up an interesting point as far as I'm concerned, and to throw this out to everybody here. This is kind of an idea, it seems to me, just looking at it as a layperson and a potential voter on it, uh, that it's kind of an if you build it, they will come idea. There aren't really a lot of incentives. We're not pumping the price of gasoline up to force people out of their cars. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, there's more bus lines, there's more trolley lines, there's more availability. Won't you folks just use that now? I mean, is that realistic? Because that's well, kind I, of the motive, isn't it? If you if you ask a lot of people around my age, um, many of them are very comfortable with riding public transit. I do want to put that quote mm -hmm. into context a little bit. Okay. So um, Circulate San Diego was one uh, environmental pro-transit group that actually broke away from the rest of the Quality of okay. Life Coalition. They said, we can support this tax because it took into account their calls for uh, a legally enforceable mechanism that would force Sandag to construct certain projects within 15 years. Okay. One of the big critiques of the regional transportation plan was that all the funding for public transit comes too late. Mm -hmm. So what they had lobbied successfully for the Sandag board to do was to amend all of the language and say, okay, if we, uh, if we pass this tax, we have to construct these projects, which include a new trolley line, by the yeah. way, in 15 years. Let's get it up front. It seems like they brokered an important compromise to, keep, to give this thing any chance it has, but I would ask you, with two-thirds approval and this much opposition, I mean, does is, does this have any chance? I, I, I think the chances are very, very slim at this point. So Sandag did a lot of polling on, on you know, how it could possibly do. Um, the, the majority was just barely above two-thirds. Uh, they, as they read more information into the poll respondents they, uh, about the actual plan, the support goes down. Mm -hmm. And then the pollster said, you know, if there's a funded, organized opposition to this, then it could just completely fall flat. Mm -hmm. Kenny? What, what's the strategy for Sandeg to uh, push this measure? Well, I think that they have a mandate from the state to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That involves uh, putting more money into public transit. So they want to, they, I think Sandag in its heart does, is interested in expanding uh, access to public transit across San Diego. But the, the, as you said, nobody wants to raise the gas tax. That would be the most logical thing to do because economists say, you know. Give them tax, economic tax, incentive, tax, yeah. Yeah, and, but, <clears throat> but, you know, the, so the sales taxes, and you're seeing them across California, these transportation uh, uh, sales taxes, are really the only method that they have. And in order for that to actually pass, they need to include all these uh, freeway projects because that, that's what people use still. Right, but I'm yeah. asking, how are they going to sell it? <laughs> well, they were on Twitter a lot today. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, they, they, there's, there's, there are a number of um, politicians uh, on the Sandag board who are um, uh, supporting it. So they're gonna, there's going to be a campaign to support it. Um, Todd Glory in particular has yeah. been a He's, he's been very, yeah, yeah no. absolutely. Uh, before we leave our, our, our segment, a wrap up for the show today, I wanted to talk a little bit about North Park. You covered the community plan this week. I know it's, it's very complicated. I don't have that much time left, yeah. but what kind of uh, development is North Park uh, targeted for here and how it might it be a model here for the rest of the city in terms of transit and, and density? Right. So they, uh, the, the city has this climate action plan. We have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, a big part of meeting those goals goals is to get more people to ride public transit. One way that you do that is by building more housing around public transit. So, you know, instead of having to drive to a public, uh, to a trolley stop or a bus stop or whatever, you can just walk, you know, 50 yards, 100 yards and take that to wherever you work. So um, that's really the goal behind the North Park Community Plan Update is, is the smart growth, transit oriented development. There's a lot of skeptics uh, to housing density. Uh, they fear that it's going to drive up housing prices. Um, it's going to build you know, skyscrapers next to my home. So there's some debate in North Park, but North Park has actually been one of the few communities 
in uh, San Diego that's actually um, asking for density. They feel that they can actually handle that. And, and you know, in contrast to some other neighborhoods like Uptown that are, are very skeptical. Okay, and as I say, this, this could then, if this were to all come together and the, the moons align, become perhaps a model for this smart growth that we're describing? Well, that, that's a big question, and we, we probably won't know right away. The, the, one of the problems that a lot of environmental groups have with this, uh, envir this um, community plan update is that it lacks, from their perspective, a real qualitative analysis on, on how all of this new smart growth, transit-oriented development, is actually going to accomplish the goals of the climate action plan you know we have to increase housing density by exactly this much and pair that with uh, you know a bus a bus that will run this often in order to cut greenhouse gas emissions they say that doesn't exist we haven't seen that data driven analysis okay and your story says it'll come to the city council this plan uh, in uh, in October. October in the fall all right well we are out of time that wraps up another week of stories at the KPBS roundtable I'd like to thank my guest Kenny Goldberg of KPBS News David Garrick of the San Diego Union Tribune, and Andrew Bowen, also of KPBS. A reminder, all of the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on The Roundtable.